We are in a series called Back to Basics, and the worship this morning really helped build us up to this point to talk about the cross, because this is Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry of Jesus, and then next week is the resurrection. But somewhere in the middle, there's that ominous Good Friday and the bleak Holy Saturday where Jesus is in a tomb, dead. And though we'd like to jump from the Hosannas to the He is risen, there's death in the middle. And I'm afraid in our lives, we do that a lot. We skip right over the death. So before next week, when we talk about the tomb, another basic part of our Christian faith, the hope of resurrection and new life and restoration, before we get to that, this week, we have to talk about dying. We have to talk about death. And we don't want to. Protestants, for 500 years, have preferred to talk about Jesus off of the cross. We don't even use crucifixes in most Protestant circles. We take Jesus off of the actual cross because he's not there anymore. And we don't want to have to think about him on the cross, bleeding and gory. It's enough about death. But even if we we remove Jesus from the cross, it's not like we forget what the cross was about, that it is a torture device. We might dress it up in gold and make jewelry out of it, but we know what it's about. It's torturous. It's, It's dark. It's morbid. And yet it is a basic foundational piece of Christian faith. There is no Christianity apart from the cross of Jesus. You cannot be a Christian. Now, I don't say this phrase very often, that you can't be a Christian unless, but this is one of those times. You cannot be a Christian unless you believe in the cross of Christ. So why the cross? Why is it so important? We, we don't want to talk about the blood and the death. We'd like to picture Jesus risen with the clouds and halos and angels singing we like that picture of Jesus. We don't care, even, even if he's on his way to the cross carrying the, the lamb on his shoulders, that's okay too, but to see him on the cross, to see the dying son of God, it just does something to us. And I think it's the same reason that in our present time, we try to have quick funerals, often with closed caskets or cremation services that can just breeze through the process of coping with death. If you didn't know, funerals used to last days But in much more recent history, we condense it to a few hours, even just a 20-minute ceremony, get them in the ground and go have fried chicken, celebrate, and and try to remember the good times. Even the people we love, we do this, because thinking about death is dark and painful and scary. We just don't want want to do it. We don't like death. When I was a kid, I remember cutting the head off of a snake with a garden hoe. And I couldn't tell you if I did it on purpose or if it was an accident. I think it was probably an accident. I didn't realize what I was doing, but I don't know. I don't remember. All I remember is it was a bit traumatic because he didn't die. Or she. I don't know how you sex a snake, but boy or girl snake. Uh, I had way too many jokes just pop into my head. Okay. Uh, It's a snake of some kind. And I remember showing my uncle. And he said... Snakes don't die until sundown. Hang it on a fence, it'll it'll die at sundown. I never knew that. No one had taught me that before. Did you know that? Snakes don't die until sundown. I don't know. He also told me that you put tobacco in a bee sting, you don't pop a blister till bedtime, snapping turtles don't let go until it thunders. (laughs) He is like a walking (laughs) farmer's almanac, basically. But there's something about what he said about snakes Now, of course, there's science behind that with the nerves still firing and the muscles twitching. They're not really alive, but they just can't die. Life is tenacious. I remember Jeff Goldblum, a good friend of mine, who said, life life will find a way. That's from Jurassic Park, if you're not familiar. It was infamous. That statement was infamous because next thing you know, all of his friends are being eaten by dinosaurs. The dinosaurs just didn't want to stay dead. You give them a chance, life will find a way. Life is tenacious. We love to talk about life, survival, but not dying, not death. And yet it's just as real as life. Every single person ever born has died or will die. You are dying right now. Every moment you are nearer death, but we don't talk about that. You're closer to dying right now than you were at the start of this worship service. But we don't talk about that. Even Jesus died. So why the cross? Why do we have to talk about it? The New Testament doesn't really give us a choice. We would argue that 
from the Gospels into the epistles and the revelation of Jesus given to John, all these beautiful stories and scriptures are full of hope and life, and, and yet they're all covered up in death, have this constant theme of dying. Even the Gospels begin with the shadow of the cross looming over the cradle, and we wonder why. The gifts the Magi bring to Jesus, pointing to his burial and crucifixion. I found some examples to tell you what I'm talking about. I'm also going to use an actual sermon manuscript today because I'm afraid this could be like an hour and a half sermon, so I'm going to stick to my notes. Matthew chapter 2. Herod commits infanticide. Sorry, we're not there yet. Uh, These are just examples. So Matthew chapter 2. Herod tries to kill the baby Jesus. You remember the story? All the little babies, two and under, has them all slaughtered just to be safe. Of course, Jesus is flown to Egypt, kept secure by the grace of God, and then Joseph and Mary bring him back to a little town, Nazareth, where they raise him. But he was born in Bethlehem, and he was almost executed. That's in chapter 2 of the gospel. Already, they're trying to take his life from the very beginning. And we know even if, if Herod dies, and he will, we know that others will come after him. And no king wants to be dethroned. This story is only beginning. We see it there in Matthew 2. We see it again in Luke chapter 2. Simeon holds the baby Jesus in his arms, and he makes this prophetic statement to Mary that because of this child, a sword will pierce your soul. What do you think he was talking about? Crucifixion. Mary's soul would be pierced as she watched her baby grow up, go into the world, and be murdered. Every mother's nightmare. That's in chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 jumps right into the life of Jesus, not so much his birth narrative. And Jesus is speaking, and the Pharisees and scribes, they condemn his friends. They say, your friends aren't fasting like they're supposed to be. And Jesus says, well, you don't fast when you're at a party. That's when you eat. But, but, Mark chapter 2, there will come a time when the bridegroom will be taken away, and then they will fast. What do you think he meant? He was talking about his death in chapter 2. And then John chapter 2, Jesus said, you destroy this temple, and I'll just rebuild it in three days. And then John makes sure we know exactly what Jesus was talking about. He says he was referring to his own body. From the very beginning, the story is tainted by death. And it seems like it's on every page. As much as we want to see the life and the good and the beauty, there's this dark, morbid death theme. And it continues through the whole New Testament. And we don't want to think about that. We don't want to talk about death or dying. We certainly don't want to think about a Savior who is dead, hanging on a cross, thrown into a tomb of a rich man because he couldn't afford his own tomb. No one wants to think of their savior that way. No one wants to think that God could become a human for a moment, and that's how his story ends. Of course, it didn't really end there, but it did seemingly end there. And if you don't see the almost ending, then you can't appreciate the final ending. And so we have to have the cross. Why the cross? Today's Palm Sunday. It seems like the most appropriate time to think about the cross. Jesus has come into Jerusalem The triumphal entry that Aaron read to you during our worship, beautiful passage in Luke 19 about all the people cheering, hosannas are ringing in our ears. He's just come to the city, and now he's coronated on a cross. Not a golden throne, not not a golden crown, but a crown of thorns, blood dripping down his brow, suffocating and dying of dehydration and exposure for everyone to see and to mock. That's your king. We have to face it. We have to talk about the cross. And so we turn to sacred scripture. What did Jesus teach about the cross? Matthew 16, verses 21 to 25. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Peter gets it. You're the Messiah. You're God in flesh. You can't die. You can't die. And then Jesus turns to Peter and he uses exorcism language. He says, get behind me, Satan. Strong words. And then he says, you are a hindrance to me for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, 
but on the things of man. And then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So now it's not just Jesus who bears the cross, but then he says, if you hope to ever follow in my steps, you'll have to carry one too. You too will have to have a cross. Why? For whoever would save his life must lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He doesn't just say you're going to have to die, but you'll have to give away your life. And there's a difference. There are plenty of people who have died and we might say they never even really lived. Just dying doesn't mean you really lived, but there is a sense in which you can live by giving away your life. And Jesus demonstrates it. The cross is a picture of giving one's life away. And Jesus says, if you don't learn how to do that, then you have no portion with me. You don't know me at all. Paul tries to help us, although he admits how confusing it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He begins this letter to the church in Corinth, a church divided, a church with a lot of issues, one of the strongest letters we've ever read in the New Testament. And this is what he says in the first chapter. For the word of the cross is folly. The word of the cross. He's talking about the message of Jesus dying the thing we're talking about. And he says, it's folly, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach. What is it he said we're preaching? The cross, Christ crucified. For Jews, excuse me, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who would believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, the dead Jesus. And it's a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are, of, who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. That verse is cool. That's the kind of verse somebody could get tattooed on their shoulder blade or something. I'm not, I'm not su supporting tattoos, nor am I condemning them. I shouldn't have even used the word tattoo. <sighs> In all seriousness, it's a cool verse. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. God saw that in our wisdom, we couldn't figure it out, what we thought made sense, so he came to us in foolishness. He made a stumbling block so that we might stumble and then have to ask for help, so that we'd rest in his wisdom rather than man's wisdom. Paul's trying to help us get it. The cross, it's supposed to be puzzling. It is an enigma. Jesus taught this way throughout his life, especially about his death and resurrection, by using parabolos, parables is what we call them. They're literally to throw a story alongside a teaching, and they were always confusing. His disciples were like, why do you talk like this in ways that are so riddled? And, and he said, because the riddles make you think, and only those with ears to hear will ever understand. They're supposed to be challenging. They're supposed to be mysterious, but we don't like that. So we start asking questions like everyone did with Jesus, asking our questions. How does it work? How does it work? What happens? And so we ask of the cross, how does the cross work? What happens upon the cross? And I've preached sermons on atonement theories and things that happen on the cross. That's not what I'm here to do today, but these questions are good. They're important. They are faith-building questions. What did God do in and through the cross? What happened there? How does it all work? But I will admit to you, the longer you study it, like some of the early Christians did, some of the church fathers, brilliant, brilliant men of God, they studied this for a lifetime, and then they would come away saying, I just really don't quite fully understand it. I tell people this all the time. Getting degrees and education should humble you, not make you proud. Because the more you learn, the more you know how much you don't know. That's what happens when we study the cross. The more I study it, the more I think, oh, it could, yeah, I guess it's that too, and it's that too, and then if it's these, then it's probably not that. Man, it's complicated. So we turn to the early church. St. John Chrysostom says, the cross uprooted us from the depths of evil and elevated us to the summit of virtue. 
That sounds great. And then he goes on and vaguely explains how that happens, but he doesn't really explain it because I don't know that you can, at least not with our finite, feeble brains. St. Gregory the Great, a little while later, he even more humbly admitted the knowledge of the cross is concealed or hidden in the sufferings of the cross. So this desert father who spent his life thinking about the cross under vows of silence and fasting and prayer, he comes away saying, you know what? The cross really only makes sense once you've borne a cross on your own back. Until you've suffered, you'll never really understand what it does. And so then he basically leaves us wondering, can we even answer the question this side of heaven? Can we know how the cross really works and all that happens in it and through it? Is the crucified Jesus the sacrifice that God demands? Is the crucified Jesus the ransom that God must pay? And if so, to whom is he paying the ransom? Is the crucified Jesus the warrior king that God sends via death on the cross into the depths of hell to fight Satan and deliver us from evil and set the captives free? Is the crucified Jesus the substitute receiving the punishment we deserve but he instead is punished. Is the crucified Jesus the model of self-giving love, the demonstration of God's love that we are meant to emulate, to become like? Is the crucified Jesus the utter fulfillment of the law, not abolishing it, but fulfilling it so that now we are free because of crucifixion? Or is the crucified Jesus some combination of multiple of these things in mysterious ways we can't really explain? A lot is happening at the cross when you really take time to think about it. Theologians spend lifetimes trying to understand the cross, how it works, what happens. And frankly, some Christians' response is to oversimplify it and just say little blanket statements that they think cover the complexity of the cross, but I would argue sometimes are a hindrance. Things like, well, the cross was where God took away his wrath. Well, that's certainly part of it, but you can't just say that's all that happened there. There was more than just the removal of wrath. There's a lot happening at the cross. We can't oversimplify it, and we're not quite intelligent enough to fully understand it. So we have to do what the church has always done and admit, though we have studied and though we seek to know, we have to admit no matter what we find out, it is a bit of a mystery, capital M. It is something divine, an exchange, and a, a relationship transformation that happens at the cross that we just can't fully comprehend. Jesus at the cross, basically he becomes a perfect sacrifice to cover over our sin and our death so that the living God can draw near. But then what happens? God draws near, he's forgiven us, but we're still the same. It may seem like we are alive because we're under the blood of Christ, but we're still sinful people underneath. So then he brings us to heaven and we just ruin that. And it becomes another hellhole like earth. That's not going to work. So God has to transform us. So at the cross, he's not only forgiving and covering the death with life, but then he's transforming those who are dead into living things again. He's uncovering his sacred image inside of every person. He's restoring a relationship between a father and his created children. He's teaching us how to love well, how to sacrifice, how to give of ourselves. He's paying a ransom, a debt that's owed for justice sake to remove wrath and punishment for justice sake to vindicate the unrighteous, and to call them righteous because of Jesus. He's teaching us his love by suffering alongside us, by taking on our own suffering. That's a lot of stuff. You think about that. That's a lot of stuff to wrap our little minds around with the cross. So maybe, maybe we should quit asking how it works. Because I can tell you when I first asked that question, how does it work, I was told essentially a story that made no sense to me. It was absurd. Well, the cross had to happen so God could forgive you. And again, they thought they were helping by oversimplifying, but, but what they did was create in me a need to disprove that theory because of how absurd it felt. So you're telling me a buddy and I get into an altercation. I have deeply offended him, but now I feel bad about it. I recognize I did wrong. I tell him I'm sorry, and he says, I forgive you, but first let me kill my favorite pet dog to prove it. You must admit that that's a little weird, and it doesn't really click. And that's sort of the presentation I was given of the cross. Well, that's what God does. He he forgives you by killing his son. There's obviously more happening than just that. Because the exchange isn't two people who got into a fight, but a perfect deity whose creatures have rebelled against him. 
And the wrong isn't just a wrong that has to be covered, but it's a relationship that has to be restored. There's a brokenness and a chasm that has to be mended and bridged. There's a lot going on at the cross. And so I think a better question, because Paul says, still, we have to preach it. I have to preach Christ crucified. We have to preach the message of the cross. Yeah, it's, fo- it's folly or foolishness. It's a stumbling block, but we can't help but preach it. Then maybe instead of trying to figure out how it works, which is good and helpful, maybe today we should ask, why is it needed? Why the cross? If we can't fully understand all the ways in which it works, I think we can at least understand why it's so important. And to do that, I want to give you two answers. And these two answers, I think, have continuity across the history of the whole church. I think any real, true Christian would agree that these two things are true, these two answers. So that's what I want to share with you. First, we need the cross. We need to preach the cross because the cross tells us something about how the world really is. The cross teaches us what the world is really like. What I mean by that is, though we'd rather not be reminded of it, the world is full of cruelty and violence and injustice, unfairness. We see it every day. Good people suffering, children with debilitating diseases and cancer, thieves and corrupt CEOs who live high on the hog, and hardworking, impoverished people who barely scrape by and make ends meet. And we look at this world full of that kind of pain and injustice, and we start to question, why? And the cross isn't the answer to why, but it's the recognition of its reality. It is this way. It's frustrating. I know it's frustrating. That's why it's folly and a stumbling block, because God doesn't say, well, this is why everything's messed up. What he says is, I am willing to admit that it's messed up, and I can fix it. The cross is admitting that it's messed up. It's looking at the world and admitting what it really is. It's it's a mirror that we must look into and see ourselves for what we really are. And I think that's one necessary purpose of the cross. When you look at the cross and you see Jesus hanging and dying, mocked, bloodied, crucified, unjustly, unfairly, you can't help but admit if it could happen to him, it could happen to anybody. He is God in the flesh. He's perfect. He's the word that was from the beginning and made all things and by whose power all things have been sustained. All that is made will bow to him. And there he lies dead. If it could happen to him, then it could happen to anybody. The world is broken. The world is in desperate need of help. The cross forces us to deal with that. There can be no hyper-positive, health, wealth, prosperity kind of gospel out of the cross. You can get that from an empty tomb, but not if you start at the cross, because there there's pain and unjust punishment and failure of humankind, inescapable failure. The world in its present condition is broken and fragile and full of pain, and I would admit it doesn't show many signs of improvement. Just as one thing improves, another thing falls away. Martin Luther, 500 years ago, during the Great Reformation, he wrote it this way in the 21st thesis of his Heidelberg Disputation. That's a mouthful. He said, religious triumphalism, or a theology of glory, that what today we might call health, wealth, prosperity, or something like that, some feel-good preaching that doesn't involve death, just skip over the cross, that kind of message ultimately has to lie about reality, has to lie about what is real. But a theology of the cross calls a spade a spade. A cross-shaped theology says, look, there's a great deal that is simply wrong in the world. Innocent people suffer, guilty people prosper. Look at all the injustice, the war, the defamation, degradation, and death. Don't turn away from it. Open your eyes to it. Because until you do, you will never be in a position to understand the pain of God or God's way of healing pain either. I think Luther's right. The cross forces us to examine reality as real for what it is. Without the cross, you don't understand God's pain, and so you can't appreciate his love, his grace, to give himself. You can't appreciate that until you face the cross. Luther's later expositor, Douglas John Hall, puts it this way, Good Friday isn't just about the crucifixion of Jesus. It never was. Good Friday, the crucifixion, is actually about the human condition. Not just Jesus, but all of humanity. 
as if God really wants to be our God, Emmanuel, God with us, then the cross is the route that God has to take. Did he have to die on a cross? Did Jesus have to be crucified? Yes and no. No, he didn't have to be in the sense that God did not owe it to us, but yes, he did if God could become like us. If he really wanted to be incarnate, if the crucifixion was real, then it had to happen. God couldn't say, I love you enough to die for you. I love you enough to experience your pain if he doesn't actually do it. He must face excruciating pain. That's where the word excruciating comes from. It's Latin for out of the cross. Literally excruciating pain. The human condition, according to to Hall, is something to both glory in and suffer from. We bear the image of God. That is glorious. God made man and woman, and he said, it's very good. But then after the fall, it becomes very bad. The cross makes us admit both of those things. I would put it this way in humility. In order to really help us, God must understand who we really are, and we must understand who we really are. God cannot relate to creatures with sin and suffering and death because God is perfect. He lacks nothing. Suffering is deprivation. God is deprived of nothing. And he's always living, has always and will always be. We call it his aseity. If he is always being, then he doesn't know what death is like. He can't connect. He can't sympathize. And as Hebrews says, now because of Jesus, we have one who can sympathize, who knows what you go through. God couldn't have done that. Carl Jung described the passion of Jesus as the limit story of evil, that there's nothing past it. There's nothing more evil than the passion of Jesus. There is no greater injustice, unfairness, treason, backstabbing, pain, helplessness, frustration in any human narrative of any kind that is greater than that of the passion of Jesus. Because in the passion narrative, we have God, the only one who can save us, being crucified, We have him being crucified unfairly, unjustly. People who don't care about truth, people who choose criminals over the innocent, his loved ones watching in horror, unable to help, his supposed friends turning on him, the very people who praised him as their king, crucifying him in public. And you could add all kinds of insult and injury heaped on there. And he does. Young gives a great list of all these evils that happen at the cross. It is the limit story of evil. It's the height of pain and suffering. We have to have it. We have to have that because we have to look upon that and face that fear of ultimate evil in order to go to the other side, which is healing and restoration. There is no empty tomb without the cross. That's what I'm saying. There is no empty tomb without the cross. You have to fill the tomb before it can be emptied. And so Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 14 and verse 15, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus said that. Does anybody know who he said that to? John 3, who is he talking to? Nicodemus. He's talking to Nicodemus. Same passage where he talks about being born again. And right after this, the next verse is John 3, 16. You all know that one. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. Right before he says all that beautiful stuff about God saving the world and not condemning the world, but setting it free, right before that he says, I'm going to have to be lifted up like the wilderness serpent. What's he talking about? Nicodemus is puzzled by this conversation. Join the club. It's confusing. So then we turn to Numbers 21, and we look. It won't be on the screen, but I'll fill you in. We look at the story of Moses in the wilderness with the people. They've been grumbling against God. He brought them out of, the des- or out of Egypt into the desert, out of slavery and tyranny into desert space, hunger and thirst and deprivation. It's almost like they went from one bad thing to a worse thing. But now God is with them. He's leading them. But that's frustrating to say that God's here, but it still hurts to say God's here, but we're still hungry. And so they grumble against Moses and against God. And God says, enough is enough. And he sends venomous serpents into their midst. It's a wild story. They start biting people and the people are being poisoned by this venom and it's coursing through their veins and they're dying and they need help. And they finally, in desperation, turn to Moses and say, please ask God to help us. And God says to Moses, okay, make a brazen serpent, a bronze serpent on a bronze staff, like a statue, you know, and hold it up. And if they look at it, they'll be healed. 
Let's not pretend that isn't weird. That's a weird story. So anytime there's absurdity in the Bible, we have to ask why. Why is that so strange? What's going on? Numbers 21, today with modern psychotherapy, we could say is, is fitting to the doctrine of face your fears. The best way to overcome fear is to face it head on. They didn't understand it. These were former slaves coming out of Egypt into the wilderness. They didn't understand psychotherapy, but God was teaching them a very important lesson. The only way to be healed of the things you are afraid of, the only way for the venom to be removed is to look upon it directly and admit your dependence because desperation leads to dependence. If you take notes, that's pretty good. Desperation leads to dependence. The Moses serpent lifted up is an act of desperation. And to look upon it is an act of dependence. To say there is venom in my veins coursing through my body. I'm dying without your help. There's nothing I can do to save myself. I need you to, to rescue me. And Jesus says, that's what's going to happen when they put me on the cross. I will have to be lifted up and you will have to look right into the face of the one who loves you that you have murdered and, and recognize the failure of humankind and the violence and cruelty of this world and the desperate need of a savior. And when you look that square right on, when you face that fear, then you can get to the empty tomb, but only after you face the cross. It's necessary. Necessary. Bravery is better than safety. A pagan scholar said that, but I think it's great. I think it's biblical. Bravery is better than safety. God kept trying to tell his people that, yeah, you were safe in Egypt. They fed you every day and watched over you. You were their workforce. Of course they did. But isn't it better to be out here brave on your own, free, and let me be your leader? But there is a nostalgia for tyranny. When you're used to being told who you are and what to do all the time, it is scary to be set free. That's a sermon for another time. The cross is an antidote for the nostalgia of tyranny. The cross is an antidote for the nostalgia of tyranny. We look at the world and we still want to fit into it. We still think we could conform to its image and make it work for us. It'll work out. I can make this work. And the cross is a way of saying, even God in this world can't work. They killed him. You think you're going to rise above it? And then Jesus says, but don't forget, they didn't kill me. I didn't just die. I gave my life. I gave my life. Belief in God is no guarantee of smooth sailing. In fact, it's sometimes just the opposite. Jesus' disciples go out in a boat, and they're caught in a serious storm. The ship's about to capsize, and they're probably going to drown. Do you know who sent them out there? Jesus did. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? It leads a friend of mine in, in ministry to say, sometimes when you start trusting Jesus, that's when your trouble really begins. And I think he's right. Because desperation is required to learn dependence. The cross does that, but, but the cross does more than that because Jesus didn't leave his friends out in the storm. He didn't lead them to desperation and then watch them crumble. He didn't call the Israelites into the wilderness and watch them starve to death. That was never God's intention to leave us desperate, but to build in us a capacity for faith and then to supply grace to fill it. And so he leads us to the cross in order to then show that he is cruciform himself, that he will die on that cross for you. The primary reason that Paul has to preach the cross is not just to tell us how the world really is, to face it head on like the serpent in the wilderness, to admit that it's broken and, and desperately in need of help. But it is also to teach us who God is, not just to realize the world and see it for, for its true self, but to realize who God is and recognize God in his love and grace. The cross does that. God suffers with us in a been there, felt that kind of way. And like Hebrews says, he's able to sympathize with our weakness. He knows what it's like. Jesus comes to them on the boat. He comes to them in the storm. He puts himself in the midst of the storm, knowing that he can help them. He doesn't sit on the shore sipping pina coladas under an umbrella, right? He's there. He's with them in the pain, in the turmoil. That's what the cross teaches us. 
That's the kind of God that we serve. It's amazing. It's amazing. How many of you have seen The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson movie? It's pretty gory. Does anybody remember before that movie, I don't remember how many years prior, a while back, they, there was another movie that came out that was really controversial, The Last Temptation of Christ. Anybody remember that? I mean, there were like churches picketing that movie and a lot of stuff, a lot of negativity around it. It was a pretty bad adaptation of a book. The book is good, though. Uh, it's, at least it's interesting. It's challenging. The book is called The Last Temptation of Christ by Nikos Kazantzakis. He's a Greek guy. And this book is powerful because it tells a story that never happened, or it gives the, the possibility of a story that never took place. What if Jesus, just before crucifixion, comes into Jerusalem and then changes his mind when he hears the Hosannas turning to crucify? And he catches wind of the plot against him. And he he begins to understand they're about to kill him now. What if in that moment he did what the rest of us would do? And he went back to Galilee and became a regular old carpenter and got married and had kids and lived a quiet life and died in peace. Thus, the last temptation of Christ. Not to suffer. Not to die. Had he felt the noose tightening around his neck, and slipped out at just the right moment and disappeared off the scene, we would not be here today singing songs about him. What a friend we have in Jesus. There'd be no hope for heaven or redemption or restoration. Jesus chose to die. What does that tell you about God? that he put on flesh and then gave his life. We know now what the cross tells us about us, that we are in desperate need of help, that there is a venom inside of us that we cannot get out. But what does it say about God that he lets the snake bite his own heel and inject him with the same venom so that he can then have authority to crush it underfoot? What does it say about him that He sees us in a storm, and he joins us in the storm. The cross speaks in ways that words cannot. It conveys a kind of love that we can't really express. We see Jesus loving us so much that he would die for us. And so then, like Peter, we come to him and say, Lord, we will follow you to the point of death. And Jesus says, no, you won't. I appreciate that you want to, but friend, you will not. You you just can't. You'll deny me. You'll fall away. You'll go into hiding. What I've come to do is something you will never really be able to do. Only I can do it. But I've come to do it for you. So let me help you. I love you. Let me help you. That's why we have the cross. It's foolishness. It's shameful but it teaches us that God hurts because we hurt. That is the kind of God you want to worship. He hurts because you hurt. God's love is so profound. His grace, his goodness, so immeasurable that we need the cross to demonstrate for us the depth of that love because words can't do it. He had, to, he had to show it. You can't just tell someone you love them. They have to see it. They have to feel it. And so we have the cross. John 12, verse 24, which will come up again next Sunday. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He got it. He could see. I have to die. I have to do this so that you can live. It's the only way. N.T. Wright writes in one of his books, Jesus doesn't give an explanation for the pain and sorrow of the world. That's why we're frustrated. Because Jesus doesn't tell us why things are the way they are. He comes where the pain is most acute, and he takes it upon himself. Jesus doesn't explain why there is suffering, illness, and death in the world. He brings healing and hope. He doesn't allow the problem of evil to be the subject of a seminar. 
He allows evil to do its worst to him. He exhausts it, drains its power, and emerges with new life. We need the cross. Would you stand with me as we close? So why do we need the cross? It teaches us how the world really is, and it teaches us who God really is. We need the cross because it creates in us desperation so that we learn to depend on God and receive his grace. We need the cross because it teaches us about God's profound love for his creatures, that he would give his own life in exchange for theirs. We need the cross. But if I could make an analogy to even further simplify, not oversimplify, but in, in a human way, simplify the story. I was thinking about when I was a kid, and I learned how to ride a bike without training wheels. And I went off the edge of our neighbor's driveway. We had a gravel driveway. Our neighbors had a paved driveway, so that's where I learned to ride my bike. It's a lot easier than gravel. Well, I went off the edge of that and down into a ditch and went over the handlebars, and my knees had some really nice scrapes. Gravel and dirt all in there. So I, I ran over to my parents crying, and my dad scrubbed the dirt and gravel out of the wounds, and my mom bandaged me up, and then she held me in her lap, and she just, you know, sat there with me. She probably had a tear in her eye and said, I know it hurts, you're gonna be okay, you're, you're so brave, you're doing great. And it was like instant, I was fine. Like, ah, it'll be fine. I went back out and got back on the bike. So this past week or two, Ada has been riding her bike without training wheels. And she fell, and she didn't have any knee pads on. She got scraped up pretty good. And she ran over to me, and I said, it's fine. It's fine. You're okay. Toughen up. And she said, no, it's bleeding. Look, it's bleeding. So I lift up her pants, and there was blood. And so we went inside, and I cleaned it up, and I put a Band-Aid on it, and I sent her back out. And I come outside, and she's pouting. She's not on the bike. She's in the corner, pouting, just standing in front of the garage. And I said, what is wrong? And she's like, it hurts really bad. I said, it probably doesn't even hurt anymore. And I thought to myself, I forgot something. I didn't hold her. I didn't tell her, it's going to be okay. I know it hurts. I didn't, I didn't hurt because she was hurting. So then I stopped and I picked her up and I said, I know that was really scary. I know that really hurts, but it'll get better. It's going to be okay. And I gave her a real big hug. And next thing you know, she's flying back and forth on the bike. Because there's some power in the, the kind of love that hurts because you hurt. There is a power greater than bandages and medicine. There is a, a transformational kind of power to have someone love you so much that they hurt when you hurt. I think that's why we have the cross. And Paul said, I have to preach that. And so do I.